Okay, it is two minutes after two o'clock. I believe that other colleagues are going to join us as we carry on. I would not want us to take much of your time, of the previous presenter's time. My name is Lois Matliko. I'm a program specialist at um, SADI. And um, I'm just here to welcome you all in this session. I'm not going to take much of your time. This is titled The Service Workshop that is offered by University of Free State. It is titled Transforming Quantitative Skills Development and Student Success Using OER. At this point in time, I would like to hand over uh, the platform to the safe hands of Professor Francois Sredom, who will lead the discussions and introduce also um, the colleagues that he is with. Over to you, Prof. Francois. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Louis. So uh, welcome, everybody, um, to the conversation. Um, it's a great privilege to be here. Um, I would like to uh, just introduce uh, the different speakers. Um, uh, I'll start um, uh, with our international colleagues, uh, Dan Ray, Director of Operations for Carnegie Power, uh, math pathway with Westhead. Then uh, it's eight o'clock in the morning for Dan. Then uh, for uh, Dr. Karen Kippel, she is the former executive director of the Carnegie Maths Pathways um, and is now an advisor to Pathways, uh, still associated with Westhead. Uh, for her, it's six o'clock. So thank you so much uh, for joining us, Karen. It's wonderful to have you here. Uh, Lewis Hosey is not with us yet. Um, he'll join us a little bit later. Um, he is Director Development and Implementation. Then the two lovely colleagues uh, sitting next to each other um, on the left-hand side is uh, Anneli Miller. She is the Teaching and Learning Manager for the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences at the University of the Free State. And then to her right, Professor Coria Jans van Vieren. She is the Vice Dean for Learning and Teaching in the Faculty of Health Sciences. She's also the head of school uh, in that faculty. So thank you to the two of you uh, for joining. Uh, it's wonderful to see um, that our colleagues have joined us uh, for today and uh, we look forward to talking to you. I'm gonna start uh, by sharing my screen. Let's see if all of this works. We'll be having uh, various hands uh, throughout um, the session. Uh, is that clear? Is that the full screen? Great. Okay. So yes. we are we are talking to you about um, transforming quantitative skills development, um, and uh, with of course the aim of student success. And a uh, specific focus in this conversation is also the exciting possibilities that are op uh, that have been opened up by open educational resources. Um, so. I wanted to just start a little bit um, with our context to give you background on how the journey started um, with um, the you know, between the University of the Free State and the Carnegie Math Pathways, um, based now at, at West Ed. So uh, it's not news for any South Africans, and our West Ed colleagues also joined us last year that we live in uh, one of the most or the world's most unequal country. Um, very stark differences between um, uh, the rich and the poor. Um, the one thing that we know makes a massive difference in, if you want to uh, use a meter for of crossing the road or building a bridge across the road between the two worlds that you see in the Time magazine uh, front page is a university degree. If you look at the diagram on the right hand side, those are indications by the World Bank of return on investment of different in different economies. And the orange bars is um, the return on investment from higher education. And you will see in the bottom middle, Sub-Saharan Africa, there is the highest return on investment uh, in the world uh, for a university degree because there's so few in. Uh, uh, institutions and a low participation rate. If you have a university degree, you have the best possible chance of lifting yourself, your family and your community um, out of poverty. That is the social justice imperative 
that we have in common. And I want to stress that um, uh, when we started working with the Carnegie Maths Pathways colleagues and I've continued working with them, I think we're, we're coming to, we first met about a decade ago, but we've been working actively with each other, I think for about three years now. But the conversation is longer that commitment to social justice is the same in both our countries. Um, because in the United States, there are also families that want to exit poverty and move and have social mobility. So that's the social justice imperative behind this work. Here I'm sharing a little bit of data we got from the South African Graduate Employers Association. It's the NSC results for uh, the 2023 report. So it's 2022 data. But I, the blue bars at the bottom indicate bachelor passes in the independent um, uh, IEB versus bachelor's passes um, in, or achieving bachelor's passes in the independent ex, uh, examination board. What I want you to focus on is I would like you to focus on uh, the top green bit. So that illustrates to us the number of metrics that wrote. But more importantly, you see the pass mark, 80%, then the number of students that got a bachelor's pass. But then you can see the number of students who wrote mathematics. And then those who passed or got above 50 for mathematics, right? And then those who achieved the distinction is only 2.71%. Unfortunately, that is declining percentages, which highlights uh, the desperate need for innovation around quantitative and statistical skills um, in the South African context. And it's exactly for this reason to find a innovative way and learn from other places in the world who are also facing challenges with students uh, being able to attain quantitative and statistical skills, how uh, pedagogy, innovative pedagogy, the use of technology, how all these things could be used to create and put students on a different trajectory in terms of their success. Colleagues, so that is the background. As I've said, I've had the privilege of uh, meeting Karen, I think around 2020, 2014 or 15. Uh, Coria and, and I met them where they were still based on the Stanford campus and the relationship has developed. So for those of you that are joining us, um, sometimes these things take quite some time, but they don't have to. Um, and hopefully today when we share with you all the lessons we've learned, we will enable you to, in your context, move fast to um, look at innovative uh, approaches. And with that, I'm handing off to Dan and Karen together. So I'm going to stop sharing and then they can share. All right. Thank you very much, Francois. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, as Francois said, we have been working together for a number of years and um, had the opportunity uh, in November to travel to South Africa to see um, really the work uh, in progress on the ground. And uh, it's just so inspiring to see what our South African colleagues have done um, or the, the result of the collaboration. So um, I feel really honored to be able to speak with you today and share with you a little bit of background. Um, and then they'll talk more about the, the collaboration itself um and and where where we where they are in this where we are in this um and um also more about uh the oer aspects of of these materials now okay so let me share my screen let's see here and i just need to get this in presenter mode. All right. Th thanks, Dan. All right. Excellent. So as Francois shared, um, we, um, uh, in the United States, have, have had, had and continue to have um, many challenges 
um, in terms of engaging students in higher education and um, and help ensuring their success in, in higher ed. So I share this um, as a bit of context. Um, in our economy right now, a college education is, is really essential to earning a living wage. Um, and in the United States, we have community colleges. These are open access institutions, uh, generally two-year colleges. Um, so completely open to anyone who wishes to join and really, I think, beautifully offer a second chance to students um, who may not have been on the path to, a, to college or university coming out of high school. Um, however, the six-year graduation rate for these community colleges is only about 39%. Uh, only 14% end up transferring to a four-year institution um, within, uh, within six years. Um, so significant struggles with attrition, uh, with success rates for students uh, and so forth. So this is part of why um, the work that we're doing, we feel is a real imperative. When we studied the challenges facing students and facing institutions in terms of student persistence and student um, success and graduation, we see that mathematics is one of, if not the biggest barriers to student success. In fact, um, coming into community colleges, and community colleges serve um, a significant percentage of the undergraduates um, in the United States. So this is a really important population we felt to, to work with. Um, at community colleges, roughly 60 to 70% of the students who come in are not ready to begin with college level mathematics. Um, they need what we, what we call developmental level mathematics to prepare them for that. However, once students enter that developmental mathematics trajectory on their way to college level mathematics, we lose about 80% of those students. 80% of those students will never make it out of that developmental math um, pathway and onto college level math. That translates to about half a million students a year whose um, dreams and hopes uh, for their future in terms of education have ended because they haven't completed mathematics. So um, that is our starting point. What what we did at the Carnegie Foundation, and this was really under Tony Bright's leadership as the president of the foundation, is we brought together researchers and practitioners and advisors across disciplines to help us imagine what a different reality could look like. So we brought together experts in math education, in social psychology, in language and literacy, in teacher professional learning, and at the same time, we brought together these research experts. We brought together um, expert practitioners uh, from the classrooms of community colleges. We brought together college leaders, and we brought together people in education policy to help us think about how we could implement something that looked really radically different. We knew that we were, if we were going to change this in a significant way, we were going to have to uh, really make dramatic changes to the current system. So the result of all of this thinking um, was the following. It was creating what we call Statway and Quantway, and that really hinged on four big ideas. The first big idea was that not every student needed to be on the path to calculus. So in the United States, coming out of the Sputnik era in this race to space, we were preparing every single student to go into calculus to be an engineer to help us in that race. And now there's a recognition that calculus doesn't necessarily serve all of our students best, right? It's not necessarily well aligned with their career interests and their career needs um, or their personal interests. So that was one a big change in thinking really across the country. Um, that, that we had to tackle. The second big idea is that students are capable of learning college level mathematics, college level concepts in fields like statistics and quantitative reasoning as the alternative to the path to calculus at the same time that they could learn the underlying um, algebraic uh, reasoning skills that they would need. 
So um, that was a, a big shift in mindset for educators to think that students could be engaged in co college level reasoning while simultaneously building up algebraic skills. And then um, the next big ideas were that we know that students learn best, of course, when they're motivated, when they're engaged, and what, what motivates and engages students is applied mathematics. So we wanted to make mathematics contextualize to contexts that were inherently interesting and relevant to the lives of students. Uh, no more naked math. Uh, if you will. And finally, this real change and shift change in thinking was around this idea that a mathematics classroom could be an environment where students feel welcome, where students feel like they belong, where students feel like they can engage with their peers and share their thinking. Um, and and really, we wanted to imagine a mathematics classroom as a different learning environment than these students had probably ever experienced before. Um, and in doing so, help them shift their own thinking about themselves as learners um, to change their confidence uh, as learners in mathematics. So those are the underlying big ideas um, that led to the development of Statway and Quantway. So let me tell you a bit about what Statway and Quantway look like. Statway and Quantway are courses that we developed. Um, first, they, as I, as I said before, are built around relevant curricula. So number one, no naked math, all um, no rote procedures disconnected from anything that students might recognize or um, value the need for, right? So no more questions about when will I ever use this. And here are just a few examples of some of the contexts. Now what's exciting about this partnership um, with UFS is all of the work that's been done to further contextualize these um, to be relevant to students in South Africa. And Honoré and Corlea will talk about that. Um, next is we couldn't just bring um, contextualized curriculum, we really wanted to um, design the learning experience to reflect what we know from research about the most effective form of pedagogy. And that is active and collaborative learning for students. So this curriculum is designed to support instructors in creating opportunities for students to discover mathematical concepts, to engage with their peers, to support mathematical discourse. Um, and all of that is built into the lesson. So you will see students um, productively struggling, as we say, um, as they explore and come to understand concepts. You will see instructors facilitating this learning process, but you won't see instructors at the board um, showing students how to do um, a procedure and then asking students to replicate that on their own. Um, so you will see a lot of thinking out loud among groups um, by students. Um, and then, of course, instructors helping students make connections between concepts within a particular lesson and across lessons uh, for the course as a whole. And as I mentioned earlier, we knew that um, how students think about themselves as learners, how students think about the mathematics classroom really needed to change as well. Um, because this is this is countercultural, this kind of learning experience. So part of what we developed were uh, routines and activities that help instructors and students together really create this welcoming learning environment, create a sense of belonging, create the structures for group work that are necessary for students to be productive in their groups uh, and effective in that group. It includes um, uh, bringing the latest research on growth mindset into the classroom in an accessible way. So again, students can um, can really change their own thinking about their ability to learn mathematics. And it includes um, strategies for helping students um, learn um, as, as students. So 
good and productive strategies. And we've continued to collect data over time that shows the impact of these different strategies in this area we call productive persistence, helping students um, persist productively in the face of struggle. Uh, we call this this collection of strategies. Um, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, um, if you're thinking like, like I was or many instructors that, wow, this sounds really different from any kind of classroom I've been in. It sounds very different from anything I've been prepared uh, to teach because I think most of us um, begin teaching the way we were taught. And this is definitely different from the way um, most of us were taught. Uh, we knew that this kind of program needed a robust professional learning uh, program. And so that is something that we have built, um, fostering a community of educators that support each other um, in our network, um, group workshops to help, to help instructors prepare to teach, and then personalized coaching um, throughout their, their teaching. All right, so that was the design. We began implementing this in classrooms. And if you'll remember, um, what I showed you at the beginning was we had about 20% of students could make it through their developmental math pathway and on to college level mathematics. What happened when we implemented this? We saw that when students went directly into college level mathematics, given the support that they need for developmental mathematics and taught in this way that I've been describing, we saw that students were succeeding at about 60% in the college level math so in the subsequent math class so that's why we say triple the success in half the time and what this shows is this success rate in both our quantitative reasoning pathway and quant way and our statistical reasoning pathway stat way over time since this was first implemented in classrooms um, the little yellow line if you can see that is enrollment um, by term so you can see that these success rates were maintained even as uh, more and more institutions began to participate um, and more and more students and instructors were involved in this process. So I will stop there. Uh, I hope I have spurred some questions for you for um, future discussions. Um, and Dan, I think I hand it off to you now, or no, Coralia. Uh, Coralia, in honoring. Uh, during this pause, though, I will invite anyone, if you do have any questions along the way, feel free to, re, you know, put those questions in the chat. We'd be happy to answer it as possible. Karen, could you maybe expand on the impact it's had in the UFS? Oh, in the US, sorry, not UFS. Yeah, it's really been, um, it's been a game changer. Um, because students who, I mean, as you saw, students who otherwise had their educational careers cut short um, because of mathematics are now able to go on. So we've seen a couple of things. One is um, institutions in the United States have now largely made the shift to introduce this approach to instruction in the sense that um, with all of these years of data, it is increasingly becoming the norm now that institutions are enrolling students directly into college level mathematics uh, with these supports for the non calculus track. So, so those first two pillars that I talked about, not everyone needs calculus and students can learn um, college level concepts while being supportive. Uh, those have swept the nation. Um, so I think about half the country now, um, community colleges are implementing that general design. Um, and the other um, change that we've seen is now students who didn't think themselves capable of learning math are doing it and it's changing their aspirations for their future. So students who thought that they could only go into these particular de degree tracks now see themselves with a broader horizon of possibilities um, and have, have really expanded um, their aspirations for themselves. So I hope that that helps.
Hey, good afternoon, everyone. So it, um, I'm just going to give a bit of background. Um, so I'm currently in health sciences, as Francois said, but also started with this project when I was still in economic and management sciences. So just giving a bit of the background and then handing over to Anneri, um, who is currently the lead of the program in that faculty. So as Francois and Karen explained, in 2014 was the first time um, that um, I was introduced also to the math or the Carnegie Math Pathways um, program. This was after joining the faculty in 2013 and then seeing that the faculty had the lowest graduation rates. And if we refer back to Francois' introduction, we really had to focus on how do we um, move the needle on graduation within the faculty. We then, when we looked a little bit closer to the data, saw that the National Senior Certificate Mathematics definitely um, had an association with performance in first year economics. Um, and that that first year economics module, again, had an association with overall um, academic success. So when looking at this, we realized that if we could um, focus on uh, quantitative skills or reasoning and improve um, performance in first year economics, most probably we will also be able to predict student overall success. So in 2014, we started discussions to better understand CMP and to see whether that could really um, help us to achieve the aim that we've set ourselves. And because of the U because it was US based, we also had to reflect on the applicability of um, the Carnegie Math Pathways program, specifically at the UFS, um, but also in the South African context. So I think after that initial discussions, um, we thought, okay, we have all our questions together, so let's go and visit Karen um, in, and ask our, our specific questions and see if we could initiate the collaboration. So we were really impressed, and, and Karen have um, explained that in detail, we were impressed by the alternative pedagogy and innovation, including the productive persistence, and exactly as they, um, in the faculty, we also realized that we had to make a very big change to influence the graduation rates. Um, also, the intensive um, care for academic staff development, and then also the focus on context-driven learning, because the moment you would like to use such a program in the South African or UFS context, we knew that context-driven learning and the, um, the change or adaption of these materials for South Africa would be pivotal um, in the success. So, in 2017, so you would maybe ask what happened between 2015 and 2017. So we had to have institutional discuss, discussions, see how we would build it in the curricula. And I think that is usually uh, where most people's questions also come from is, is how did you do that? So we really um, went and analyzed the outcomes of the modules um, looked at um, the, the scaffolding of learning that the students had to go through to really perform well in the first year economics ma uh, module and see how we could slot that into all the BCom degrees um, in the faculty to really then um, improve their performance in economics, but then also be able to predict um, what other influences they would be on overall graduation. So once we were satisfied that we knew where we wanted um, to slot this into the curricula, and that was, um, Anari will talk a little bit about that later, we started to map the content, specifically um, against our existing quantitative skills modules, um, and then making sure that we still reach our learning outcomes. 
And um, we also were writing funding proposals, both for internal and external um, funders, specifically for the contextualization work. Um, as I said before, we knew we had to focus quite a lot on the contextualization. So in 2019, our proposal was accepted by the UFS and other funders, and we were then really um, starting to prepare for implementation. So I'm going to hand over to Anari to just talk about the specific implementation. All right, welcome everyone uh, again. So yeah, it's my privilege to, to share with you. Um, you. You now heard the background, but how we went about uh, implementing this. So Karen introduced the two uh, programs, if you would, uh, Quantway, which is a quantitative reasoning course, and Statway, which is the statistical reasoning course, which we then both implemented into the first year curriculum of all our BCom programs, a Quantway in semester one and Statway in semester two. Um, and the, I think it, I just want to point out that for most of our students, you know, when it comes to the statistics a little bit later on, but for most of our students, when they come into a BCom degree, they have passed NEC math. So they do have a mathematics background um, and the quantitative concepts and mathematical concepts that they are exposed to in Quantway it is more familiar. While most of our students, on the other hand, do not have that exposure to statistics at, at high school level. So Statway for our students are traditionally more challenging and more unfamiliar content. So we've adapted Quantway and Statway based on, on the mapping. And we initially planned for a 2020 face-to-face -face implementation. So for face-to-face -face classes um, and in, in the South African context, but then of course COVID hit um, in 2020. So we did postpone our implementation due, due to that and implementation then happened in 2021. And we used the year of 2020 to adapt the plan to implement using the online platform or impl uh, implementing an online offering of the materials. Now, why I wanna, I think one thing that is very unexpected and I think maybe we can say thanks to COVID, we've seen what we've learned is that the online offering really made it possible for us to let our students large classes this year we've got 1400 students registered per semester and to allow us for the four lecture periods that the students have to work together and collaborate in small groups um, in the south african context in the ufs context in particular we do not always have the physical resources in terms of venues uh, to, to make this happen for a large class um, and also to promote the engagement um, in a large class. So the online offering really assisted us. What that online offering looks like, uh, Lewis will, will give you a little bit of an indication after the break. Like I said, it was for all our BCom students, we pitched the courses at an NQF level five, both of them. Um, and it's 16 credits per module based on the outcomes that we've mapped. Um, and these modules replaced our traditional business calculations modules, if you would, that we had um, for our BCom students, which is the math stats modules for our BCom students. We used the online platform, um, Realize It, that's the technological platform. Wonderful thing is it integrates with the LMS. Um, but of course, Lewis will talk to, to, to that a little bit later on. And then I think another benefit of using the online platform, um, and I think now even in a face-to-face -face space now with the OER, is that all the learning materials are provided to the student. Um, and there's no textbook required. And the student doesn't have to take out extra fees to buy a textbook. Now, we've talked about the adapted pedagogy or the innovative pedagogy. So I'm just briefly going to, to tell you what that looks like. 
Um, but basically for each lesson, um, in Quantway we've got 37 lessons and in Statway we've got 32. For each lesson, uh, it, it is broken up into three pieces. Preparation, collaboration, and exercises. Now, the preparation is asynchronous online uh, uh, engagement by the students, so they can do this in their own time, individual time, which prepares and contains material and exercises that prepares the student for the collaboration. The collaboration takes place during our four scheduled lecture periods. So we don't lecture during our lecture periods, we provide a platform for our students to work together on an activity. Um, and the instructors only facilitate this as, as Karen explained. Um, and the wonderful thing is in small groups. And in our case, we've divided the groups the, uh, for, for students in the collaboration to three to five students um, that work together on an activity. Um, taking into account a large class of 1,400 students, um, that is something that we really saw, and, 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 and I will show you the feedback from the students as well, but we see the benefit uh, for our students in, in following this approach. And then after each collaboration, students go and complete some exercises. Um, and this is also then asynchronous um, on an individual basis, basically for homework. And all of these aspects are graded. Um, and this is just a, an indication and a screenshot of what a typical lesson, lesson plan would look like or a learning map um, showing you that if a student enters the LMS in our case, um, they click on preparation, complete the activity, they click on the, the green dot for collaboration and they can join the classroom there, the online classroom. All right, so just in terms of some qualitative feedback from our students, um, you can see it there on the screen. I'm just quickly going to read some two of them for you. The one student said, I've learned a lot about the country, context driven learning. I've learned a lot about the country and how policies around the world are related. I have learned how some concepts are applied in my life, like the tax system. This course has some links which can be followed to further your learning on specific concepts, which is very exciting. Um, and then just with relating to the collaborations, another student said, the group collaboration for me was extremely useful, getting different points of view from different individuals and learning how there is more than one way to answer certain questions is what, what the student found most beneficial of the course. But of course, I have to go into some stats, into some uh, uh, numbers in terms of the impact on our students. Um, so what I'm sharing now is basically the academic results. We can see that the students fi find value in this um, from the qualitative feedback, but what happened academically? So um, on the graph here, the blue bars represent the final mark, the average final mark in the course. The red bar is the success rate, so the proportion of the students that pass the course and then the green bars are the proportion of students that passed with distinction. So I'm showing from 2020, which is pre Quantway Statway, uh, up until 2023, up until last year. So we want to compare 2021 to 2023 with 2020. So as you can see here, uh, as mentioned previously, um, the success rate did increase. Um, not, I, I, I want to say not by 10%, but the success rates were at 87% at in 2020. Um, but this is because um, our students entering these courses do have a mathematical background. Um, and the, the, the final mark average did also increase, but I think most significantly for us, the proportion of students that passed with distinction did increase significantly from 41% to, to 56% is 15%. Um, in a class of 1,400, that's a lot of students. Um, that just shows that the students had a more deeper understanding of the con concepts that they were working with. And 
then we move on to Statway, which is our second semester statistical course. The, the one year, of course, where our students do not necessarily have the, the, the NSC or high school background in statistics. So um, here you can see that the final mark average, um, the success rate, and the proportion of students all increased from four hour students on all three levels. Um, for, uh, the, the success rate from 78% to 83%. And again, the pass with distinction um, increasing from 14% to 22% of our students passing with distinction. And of course, um, I, 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 I am not missing 2022. I, <laughs> I have to talk about this. Now, I just want to give some context. Our students um, at the Faculty of Economic and Management Sciences in 2022 was the year that we brought all our students back for the first time for face-to-face -face classes um, after COVID. And this trend of that decrease um, is very similar, is exactly what we saw on average in the whole faculty. So the students in Statway followed the same trend as our students in the faculty. And actually the fact that we did not see that in Quantway, which was the first semester course, is actually, actually significant to us. I also just want to touch on some, some equity gains. I think through the introduction, this is something that we, we are interested in tracking. So throughout the um, implementation of Quantway Statway um, in, in our curriculum, um, I just want to show the average final marks for our white students versus our black students, which is indicated by the red bars. The blue bars are the white students. Now, we implemented in 2021. There you can see the average final mark for our um white students and black students in 2021, up until 2023, the gap has decreased significantly. And in 2023, it was the first year that we saw our black students outperforming our white students in terms of the average final mark. Um, if you are wondering why the decrease in the average final mark, we have uh, phased the the implementation in and our cohort increased substantially. Um, like I mentioned, um, in 2021, we had about 400 students. In, in 2023, just over 800. And this year, about 1,400 students. So the cohort um, increases a lot, which, which explains that slight decrease in the overall average final mark. At the bottom there, I, I just put some stats there for our faculty as a whole in terms of the pass rates so that you can see that this decline in the gap between white and black students is not necessarily what we saw on average in the faculty. Um, so, so we are very um, encouraged by, by these results in 2023. Now, um, you saw the numbers, you saw the qualitative. I think I just briefly want to also share some stories um, of our student, one is particular student, uh, Mamuso, he, he had, he was a second year student, um, or he was a first year student in 2021. And he had uh, uh, passed the Quantway and Statway courses then. And in 2022, when he was a second year student, he started writing a book on how to master mathematics um, by Musa Wandile, Vincent Ntkunu. And he um, actually uh, uses the principles that we teach in terms of the productive persistence, especially in the courses that he, he um, used to inform his, his book. Um, and we are extremely proud uh, to, to have a student um, achieving this in, in, in his second year of study um, based on his experience in the courses. Then I also just want to show a very short video clip from one of our facilitators. This is Lenzo. Um, he is one of our facilitators. He's also a research assistant. Um, we asked him to share his perspective and his experience in facilitating the course. 
Um, and he sent me a seven minute video clip, which unfortunately I can, cannot show everything. <laughs> but um, we, if you want to, you're more than welcome. I'll share with you. But I had to trim this down. Um, so just a, a one minute clip from Lenzo. Eight. And okay, even lastly, and now lastly, uh, both in this world revolution has challenged the status quo. This program tiny could not be perfect uh, because it's very relevant. Students would sit in many different comfortable positions you can think of and say, but say, this is the most fun and exciting class I attend and lead to first. And we learned we learn a lot from each other, believe you me. <laughs> so yeah, I cannot count how many things we learn from each other, uh, from calculation tricks, uh, to politics, to philosophy, philosophical debates, uh, historical events. <laughs> yeah, we just learn a lot. <laughs> right. and... Brilliant. So I think we are just as excited about using the different context to for students to relate to the ma mathematics. So um, what I want to show now quickly is, of course, we started all of this uh, to improve overall student success and possibly increase the predictability of student success. Now, our very first cohort of students that had EQMB, sorry, that's our quant, our, our module code for um, Quantway and Statway. Um, they, in 2023, was, of course, now in their third year. So um, our students graduated last week and walked across the stage on Friday, and we are very anxious to, to work on this data and see the impact on graduation rates specifically. But as a teaser, if you would, um, we went and looked at the impact or, on subsequent second year and third year modules of our students that had Quantway and Statway, and whether there was a statistical, statistically significant difference between students, let's say the first module there, EAC 2608, that's accounting two, um, is there a statistically significant difference in the final mark between students that had Quantway and Statway and students that did not? So we did this for all the second and third year modules in accounting and economics specifically. So um, I just want to highlight there that in accounting two, which is traditionally one of our high risk modules or high high impact modules or areas for improvement. <laughs> um, students that had EQ, that had Quantway and Statway on average had a final mark of 10.46% higher than students that did not. And this translated even into their third year. Students in accounting three, EAC 3708, that had Quantway and Statway on average had about a final mark of about 4% higher than those that did not. And then also in the economics discipline, I specifically want to talk about that one at the very bottom, EECM 3714. That is our third year econometrics module. Again, traditionally a, a very challenging module for our students, uh, quantitatively. And students with uh, Statway and Quantway on average had a final mark of 8.3% higher than, than those that did not. So for us, this was also, this is very encouraging. Um, those where we did not see, just wanna to touch on that, the statistic, uh, statistical significance um, are in our Bachelor of Accounting program. And the reason for this is there is not a lot of students because we don't have a lot of, um, we don't, this, these are not service modules. We don't have a lot of students um, that did not have Quantway and Statway, and there we lose our statistical power. All right. Um, so I think we just wanted to show that the pedagogy and the program resonated with our students. I hope you can see that. But we also just want to briefly touch on the professional professional development and the support that we receive 
uh, from the Carnegie Math Pathways program and our West Ed colleagues. So Dan, I don't know if you maybe just want to 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 touch on this. Yes, thank you, Honoree. Um, one of the things that we realized very early on in this work that this sort of instructional approach can be quite transformative for instructors and the, the sort of typical approach is that instructors do teach the way that they were taught. And that's something that can be very comfortable and that this sort of uh, attention to active and collaborative learning and really viewing the instructor as the facilitation of student discussion is something that requires a certain amount of professional learning and professional support throughout the process. And this really starts early on before instructors would typically teach a stat way or a quant way course, we would have uh, professional learning, a, a new faculty training for those instructors. And for the UFS context uh, in particular, we, we did this remotely. So that was structured to be about four days. We try to do this anywhere from a week to two weeks before the course actually starts so that the instructors or the facilitators know that they're teaching the course. It's sort of, it's not so far in the distance that uh, it seems less important. It's close enough that they can really start wrapping their heads around this instructional approach, but also everything else that is included here. The attention to social and emotional learning throughout the course, in particular during those first four weeks is, is quite significant. So we have that initial training for uh, instructors, but then we have ongoing uh, check-ins throughout really the first term, the first couple of terms. Um, and those are all facilitated, by the way, by an experienced instructor. We think that it's important that the, the facilitator of the professional learning is someone who has lived the experience themselves they've made the transition from maybe being a bit more traditional in their approach to really embracing and being successful with this instructional approach. So bi-weekly check-ins with the facilitators is the way that we, we set up that ongoing support where we were um, facilitating conversations around what they were seeing in their students in their sections. Um, not only providing technical support as outlined here, but also developing that community of practice where those facilitators are sharing not only what they're seeing with their students, but also what they're learning and how they're adapting to their students. Because of course that is going to be different for each section and for each course. So providing that space for them to do some community learning and sharing is also quite valuable in this whole process. Uh, lastly, just to differentiate, we're, we're gonna talk in a bit about the materials themselves, but the professional learning is really part and parcel for the Carnegie Math Pathways approach. Brilliant. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. So I think we just wanted to also show um, in a diagram what, what Dan just spoke about and the intense uh, support, uh, support and development that the uh, professional development that that also occurred and that we received. Um, so our wasted colleagues from the Carnegie Math Pathways program, as Dan mentioned, um, in the middle there, they they had the bi-weekly meetings um, with our facilitators where we uh, had that collaborative and, and sharing uh, uh, sessions uh, with our facilitators directly. Um, but, and, and I must say, in the beginning, I think it was one a week <laughs> and that later changed to, to bi-weekly. So we really received wonderful support. Um, but apart from that, we also had direct meetings with, uh, well, most of our presenters here, with the leadership from the Carnegie Math Pathways with a project team every week to discuss challenges, to discuss improvement, to discuss the data and to validate data and findings um, where we've also worked together there. 
And then also the Carnegie Math Pathways team provide, if you use the online platform, direct technical support to our students. But um, then also our students, of course, um, our facilitators had these four hour sessions with our students a week, again, informing our practices and our discussions and our collaboration through three iterations. All of this informing the, the contextualization of, of the materials as well. But before we get into the contextualization, and of course, how this program that we've just talked to you about moved uh, and, and has become an open educational resource, I think it is now time for us to have a short break. Um, um, if I can then maybe ask if we can have a seven minute break and that we then rejoin at five past three so um, we can then move into the second section of of the session about the contextualization and OER. Thank you everyone, we will see each other at five past. So um, as we already said, we realized that we had to contextualize quite a lot of um, the materials for the South African context or then um, the UFS context. Um, and initially, um, we just did the contextualization ourselves. So we divided the contextualization into three big um, categories. The one was minor contextualization, intermediate and whole unit contextualization. So the minor contextualization, we um, classified that as only metric unit changes and then words or phrases that we changed. So for instance, faculty, we changed to lecturer or academic staff. Um, but we did this in the preparation exercises and in the collaborations, but not yet in the um, exercises as that was also used um, for the formal assessment. Um, and we would then influence the whole question bank. Um, so in the initial iterations of contextualization, we did not change that in the exercises. If you now think back about um, the innovative pedagogy, pedagogy that Anneri shared earlier. So if we move on to the intermediate contextualization, that was where we replaced questions or examples within units. So it was still not the whole unit that we contextualized, but questions or sections of units. For instance, um, baseball or basketball, we would change to um, similar um, examples in soccer or rugby. Um, American states, we, for instance, changed to South African provinces with comparable population data, or then temperature, rainfall, we also changed to South African areas that were comparable with those weather conditions. So the, the um, reasoning behind the question stayed exactly the same. It was only the examples um, or the questions that changed to be more familiar. Um, to the students. Then there were whole units that we thought um, the students would really struggle with as they would not be able to relate to any of the content in the unit. And those, um, we contextualized the full unit. We only contextualized two um, in the initial um, round. And we will go into um, the three iterations or four iterations of contextualization um, that we did. Um, those, for instance, um, included a U.S. census-based unit, which we changed completely to South African census data, focusing on the availability of water and electricity in South African households. Um, also, the U.S. cost of living, we changed completely to South African cost of living, um, then in very specific um, areas of South Africa. And then the U.S. wage-based units, 
um, we changed to a unit based on South African minimum wage. So even those, even though this sounds um, not that difficult to do, there's a whole um, process in the background to really ensure that the contextualization still meet the requirements of the pedagogy, um, the research that went into the way in which this um, specific content are built. And I'm going to ask Lewis to just talk a little bit um, about the process of contextualization um, with which the Carnegie Math Pathways colleagues also assisted us quite extensively. Thank you so much, Carla, and good day, everyone. And this is, a, of course, a new voice to the presentation team today. Um, my name is Lois Hosey, and as Carla mentioned, um, I've been delighted to have worked with our UFS partners on this process of contextualization over the past few years. Um, and what we see on the screen here is a diagram of the the contextualization process that we were all engaged in. Um, at the very beginning of, of the project, we conducted a, an analysis of both either the Quantway curriculum or the Statway curriculum, um, and really getting very clear on the topics in those courses that we wanted to keep an eye on um, and prioritize for recontextualization. And I'll show you an example of, of a, a nice spreadsheet document that we use to do this in a moment. Once we had a, a list of topics that, that we wanted to contextualize, then we'd start a process of brainstorming various ideas that we wanted to use. We had Carly just a moment ago talking about some of the some of the key types of things, changing changing types of sports, for example, or changing location. Um, but of course, a big part of this is wanting to ensure that we can support the context that we choose with real data. And that, that of course, does require a lot of legwork leg on, on our end to go out and find the data that support the new context. Um, from there, we'll be working in, in groups, collaborating, producing um, updated content based on, on the new data, uh, testing and piloting, getting feedback from both students and facilitators, and then starting the process again. So I think for, for both Quantway and Statway in the UFS context, we, we must have, have went through this process um, multiple times for each course, maybe maybe 10 to 15 times over, over the years to really um, get to the point now where, where both sets of curriculum materials are fully contextualized for the South African context. Um, and we can move on now. Um, for those of you that are um, appreciators of spreadsheets, this is a, an example of a working document that we would continually return to as we as we recontextualized content in Quantway or Statway and started um, really monitoring and prioritizing different topics um, and that would fall into the different phases of contextualization work as Carly assured. So you can see here um, columns A and B, if we can if we can make that out, are, are the, the topics that are the key topics throughout the Quantway curriculum. And from there in column C and D, we have a prioritization and in column D, a, an indicator of the extensiveness of updating that particular section. So this is a, this really allowed us to, to be very efficient in, in, how, in how we applied the time um, and splitting the work of actually doing the recontextualization. Um, one I can call out particularly, and I think Corlea mentioned this one, so we can see, and in, in, it's very small, but on row eight is the, the original context for, for unit 1.7 in Quantway is around um, contexts that are based in the US tax system and really 
inviting students in small groups to make sense of that process. It's not a straightforward process, but we're using mathematics to make sense of of the the, the tax process. So that's a, a a very very much contextualized originally to the U.S. Um, context, and of course that is a good example of something that was high priority and um, high lift. So we had to do a lot of of research to find the the comparable um, process within the South Africa context and um, to make sure that that was meaningful and, and relevant for South African students. And yes, we can move on again, Corlea, you can wrap up here. So um, thank you very much, Lewis. So throughout all of the contextualization work, we obviously wanted to hear the students' voice and how they um, related to the context um, that we contextualized. Um, so even though the quantitative data show us that they really enjoyed um, the units, um, most of the units, um, they also enjoyed the units of, of the context specific to South Africa, and there wasn't a big difference. Um, but in the qualitative data, um, a lot of, of hints was given that the students really enjoyed those type of lessons which, which they could relate even more. So one of the um, quotes from the students said that all the skills we learned about quantitative reasoning, estimation, thinking, flexibility, applying mathematical concepts to different contexts and situations was extremely helpful. And they also spoke about things like figuring a budget for yourself, where should one go with regards to interest and tax rates. Um, so we, we learned from the students that they really, really appreciated these contextualization work. Um, but unfortunately, because we were such a small team, um, and as I said previously in 2021, for the first iteration or the first cycle of implementation, we were only um, able to contextualize two units um, in Quantway and Statway, respectively, um, showing the 3% and 3% on the first pie chart. The 46% is then global context. So that would refer to things um, like energy consumption, the world population, the use of social media. So not US specific, but um, a very interesting also more on a global front. While the 48% in the maroon shows um, content that were more US based still in the first year. So in the second iteration in 2022, um, we've added another two whole unit um, contextualizations in each of the two modules, Quantway and Statway, um, reducing the 48% to 42%. Um, but that is then really here where we, where we thought we had to leverage um, the contextualization work um, to really fast track that. And um, we were very, very lucky to get Kresge Foundation funding um, to appoint additional um, people to assist the team in the contextualization for um, the 2023 iteration. So you would see in 2023 and the current um, use of the module, we now have 0% US-based uh, material um, in the South African version of the Carnegie Math Pathways, the global content still remained at 46%, and then Quantway and Statway, 22% and 32%, um, respectively. Um, and this is really um, work that we, we would not been, have been able to do uh, without the funding from the Kresge Foundation. Um, and really also something that we are extremely proud of that we were able in such a short space of time 
um, to contextualize the, the um, Quantway and Statway uh, module specifically then for the South African or UFS and UFS context. So in 2023, we've decided that um, we now have the Kresge Fund and we would like to add an additional component to contextualization, a little bit linked to decolonization. And we've added one question to all units um, in Quantway and Statway where the students could provide further feedback. And we said, explain to your group in the small group uh, collaboration, any other context, such as from your culture, your community, or your history, where the concepts you learn today will also be relevant. Um, and we got really a lot of extremely valuable feedback. Um, so we did it, all the collaborations are video recorded and we got this information also through analysis of those video recordings of the specific question to go and hear how would students apply these in their context um, from where they come? And you can see um, a couple of the examples. One that I want to um, highlight is the one that said in everyday life, we have to think about statements that were given, be it political statements, be it teenage pregnancy in our community and stuff like that. So what we did with that specific quote is we then in the next iteration took teenage pregnancies and contextualized one of the units to focus specifically on teenage pregnancy um, in South Africa, just to give you an example of how we have used student feedback consistently throughout the contextualization process to try and really be true um, to the CMP values of context-driven um, learning. So we have spoken um, a little bit about the OERs and now um, also um, the South African version. So I'm going to hand over um, to Dan and to Lewis um, that will now talk specifically about the OER resources. So I'm going to stop the share um the screen sharing on my side and then Dan and Lewis can share from their side for the last um, section of the presentation. Thank you very much. Yes, and thank you, Coralia. Yeah, so we are going to switch here for the remainder of the webinar and really focus on this transition to OER resources. So far, we, you know, we've heard about the Carnegie Math Pathways approach and importantly, the work that our colleagues at UFS have done around implementing and localizing Statway and Quantway. For the remainder of the session here, we want to provide information about how you can access, uh, access those resources, how you can use those resources, and ultimately options for how to use the full course materials that have been contextualized and designed for the South African student. Uh, and I will again encourage any questions. We hope to have some time for Q&A at the end of the webinar, but encourage you to still use the chat if any questions come up as a way of perhaps getting those questions answered earlier or helping us provide relevant information. All right, so the first question, why OER? And why now? Uh, Karen shared earlier some of the outcome data that we have gathered over our 10 plus years of both creating and implementing the Statway and Quantway curriculum and the courses and the pedagogical approach. Much of that resource, uh, much of that research has been around student success, in particular versus more traditional approaches and traditional curriculum. And a part of this research has always meant limiting access to course materials, either intentionally or, or sometimes quite unintentionally, because only institutions that were a part of the research and participating in the professional learning, and particularly the data collection, 
<clears throat> excuse me, were, uh, were able to implement those courses. And then the goal was for the more traditional courses that we were comparing to that those instructors and those students were experiencing a, a more traditional approach to instruction, all of which contributed to what ultimately became a very limiting access as, as even evidenced through the time frame that our colleagues at UFS gave for when they first engaged in this process and when they were finally able to implement the courses. However, we're now at a stage where we have more than sufficient data supporting efficacy. We're really looking now to provide more equitable access to what we now know is a proven approach. And we do want to continue to learn about how local implementations and adaptations can bring benefits to a broader range of students. And Lewis will give us a tour here shortly of where course materials can be located, but I wanted to start with more information about how materials are being shared globally. Uh, go ahead and click one more time there for me, Lewis. Thank you. Uh, first, what is available? We are making available, again, globally, all of the student-facing materials. Uh, in including um, all of the instructor supports. On the instructor support side, that includes things like facilitation prompts for the collaboration and for uh, encouraging student discussion, strategies from experienced instructors, lesson extensions, and of course, even solutions. And Lewis will talk a little bit about how we're managing access to those things but also a comprehensive resource with all of the social and emotional learning activities that we refer to as productive persistence. Those activities and routines are also being made available to instructors. Part of making these resources available meant having to decide how we were gonna make them available. And the choice that we made was to go with Google Docs because that allows for easy online access and even editing without any additional software, but also because it's easily convertible into other electronic formats, such as Word or even PDFs for printing. Uh, another advantage of the Google Docs format for us has been we've always collaborated with colleagues and and instructors really across the country and across, across the globe. So it has facilitated collaboration and version control. Uh, right now, if there was an error that was noticed on a page, we could fix that in a matter of seconds. And anyone who would go and access those resources would always be able to get the most current version. Uh, and then the other decision, of course, was licensing. You see the, the graphic here for CC by NC. The CC is Creative Commons. It's a license that's recognized for being open access and has very broad allowances. The two subcategories there of by and NC. By just means that any use is permitted with a simple attribution stating what the original source for the materials and derivatives, where those come from, from Carnegie Math Pathways. And the NC allows for all use that you could probably imagine short of commercial and financial gain. So we really wanted to keep it as broad as possible for what instructors and institutions can do with these materials. Okay, um, thank you so much, Dan. There you go, thank you. Um, so I think for for some folks here that that have some insight into the the OER landscape, what I'm about to say here might 
you, you might already know this, but 15 months ago when we started discussions internally about shifting to an OER model, part of that was trying to make sense of what the, the OER landscape looked like at that point. And many of you here may know that there are multiple what are referred to as referatories online that, that do a, a, a pretty good job of collating um, OER materials for a whole host of disciplines and instructors, members of the public can access these referatories and, and identify and find OER material for them to use. But what you might also know is, is that there's a, a huge volume of OER material out there and it can be quite overwhelming for educators or um, other folks interested in using open educational resources to find um, high quality material. So with that part of, part of um, one of the, the key things that we wanted to do with our shift into the OER space is, is make it as easy as possible for folks to find and use our materials. So I'm going to um, spend maybe the next 10, 15 minutes walking you through um, our um, OER website. And I think um, from looking at a few of the participant names, I recognize a couple of folks. So some of you might be already somewhat versed in, in exploring our site, but I want to show um, a little bit about how we can access materials, both the student materials and instructor materials, as Dan mentioned, and also talk a little bit about um, the technology, technology side of things as well, um, before going into showcasing a few different um, implementation options that, that, that could be of interest to you. So at this point, I'm going to be changing tabs here. Um, what you will see now is the is the homepage of the Carnegie Math Pathways OER website. And at this point, I'm going to put the link into the chat for everyone. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about why in a moment. Um, but as I said, this is us on the homepage of our OER site. If I scroll down a little bit, I'm presented with a series of different areas in our website. OER curriculum, which is where I will access in a moment. Courseware, this is a, a, an area of the website that details um, some important information about the technology component and a few other options around PD and, and what's referred to as productive persistence, some other um, instructional approaches that um, supplement implementation of Point Wayne Statway. But I want to spend most of the time um, exploring the OER curriculum. So I'm going to, first of all, click into the OER curriculum tile. And we can see here I'm presented with um, what we call um, our, our OER course solutions. So these are, our, we have six full courses that we have transitioned into the OER space. You'll notice um, at the top left here, we have Quartway Core, which was the, the course that, or one half of the course um, that, that we have sort of contextualized for, an, for implementation at, at um, the University of the Free State and also um, Statway on the bottom row here. We can access any one of these core solutions by again, clicking on the, the tile. So I'm gonna go into Quartway Core here. I have some um, high level description about the, the, the goal of this course, some more details about what's available in this course. Um, some more US specific details around implementation. But you might notice that at the top right here, um, I have a, a link to a downloads area. So I can either click the downloads area or simply scroll down the page a little bit. And I'm taken to 
the downloads area for this particular course. You can see in one column, I have all my student materials. And what you'll notice here is I can see the four modules that make up the original US version of this course. But then you can see immediate, immediately below, I have this the four modules that make up this course specific to the South African context. Scrolling further down, um, there are other curriculum materials that um, can be used in a quant way implementation. Fundamentals materials are, are foundational mathematics topics, pre-algebra, arithmetic, that can be used to support the mathematics being done in quant way. And a few other um, other examples of, of materials that have been recontextualized for a for a, a specific thing. Um, so we've got a series of social justice lessons and further down different lessons that have been recontextualized for specific career and uh, workforce trajectories. So what I want to do first of all here is I'm going to click into Quantway Core Module 1 the South African version. And what you'll see is it immediately opens up a Google Doc for this entire module. Um, and I want to point out a couple of things that I think are, are quite useful as we begin to explore the materials in, in Google Docs. Um, I have a I have it, this outline for me comes on by default, but if it doesn't for you, I, I highly recommend clicking the show document outline at the top. Um, it lists um, all the, the, the key parts of the lessons that comprise module one, and it makes it a lot very much easier to navigate around in the document. Um, similarly, the first page of all the modules are a table of contents page. So you can see this is what we call module one, recontextualized for South Africa, driven by our partners at, at UFS. And we have bookmark um, links to, to all the units that make up this, this module. Um, so again, this makes it very easy and quick to navigate to specific lessons within the module. And we'll just scroll down here so you can have a look. One additional thing I'll mention that should be a, a routine or a norm when you begin exploring these Google Docs this version that I'm in just now is, of course, the version that, that we make available to everyone. So that no one, with the exception of us, understandably, has any editing powers over this version. So I really encourage you, when you first access a Google Doc, either as student materials or instructor, as I'll show you in a moment, I really encourage you to make a local copy. So this will add a version um, of the document to your Google Drive, and you can do whatever you want with that version. You can start testing and, and maybe making modifications if that's what you're interested in. You can start, um, you can print it, export it as a Word document, as a PDF document, share it with, with peers, um, print it, share it with students. So lots of different, um, options available once you make that local copy. Right. Now, switching back to the downloads area of Quantway, um, some of you may have noticed that on the other side of the page, I have my instructor materials. But the links to these materials are not, at this point, active. So this is something that, that Dan mentioned just a few moments ago. We were very mindful about wanting to maintain the, the robustness of the instructor materials. Um, so we do have a, a, a very streamlined sign-up and vetting process that we ask users to, to go through before getting access to the instructor materials. 
And I think some folks on this call have, have went through this process already. But I do encourage you um, to do it right now. I know Dan is, is keeping an eye on the sign-ups sheet on our end. So if, if, if you do follow along with what I'm doing here, um, we can give you access to the instructor materials pretty much instantly or certainly before we, we wrap up here today. But I encourage you to navigate to the sign-up page. Um, some details here that we that we really use just to, to make sure that that folks that are getting access to the instructor materials will, will use those materials in an appropriate manner. And um, so name, email address, institution and role, um, in addition to some um, preferences around um, communication going forward. So you can either opt in or opt out of that. Um, typically, when someone goes through this process, we, we aim to, to provide full access to the materials within two business days. But I think um, here, if, if you do sign up, um, we will endeavor to fast track you through um, either before we finish up here or, or immediately after. But I'm gonna go ahead and, and sign in. Thankfully, I myself have been vetted um, already so I can log in. And then I will navigate back to my Quantway Core page and scroll down to the downloads area. And we can see now that I, I my instructor materials links are now active. So similar to what I did with students, uh, the student side of things, I'm going to open up Quantway Core Module 1 for South Africa, the instructor notes. And again, this opens up um, in a Google Doc format, very similar opening first page where I can see you, all the units that comprise module one, all bookmarked. I can very quickly navigate to the facilitator notes for particular units. If I scroll down a little bit further, I will get to the um, solutions for this particular unit. Again, using the, the outline on the left is, is super helpful just to help us quickly navigate to specific sections within lessons. And again, I encourage you to, to, to bake in the routine of when you access a Google Doc. The very first thing you can do is make a copy just so you've got that local copy for yourself and you can you can really do anything with that local copy. Um, a couple of things I will just point out um, relating to the downloads area. We heard Dan talk a little bit um, earlier about um, this, this notion of attribution. Um, so there's a couple of links here at the top right that, that just provide some, some useful guidance around a couple of different key areas relating to the documents. Um, what attribution actually means in this context is we've applied a license CCBYNC, as Dan mentioned, this provides a lot of, of um, capabilities to users to modify and use these materials. Um, but there is a, a strong sort of recommendation that if these materials are used and adapted in some way, that a because folks will be making local copies and, and maybe sharing those local copies with, with other folks, that an attribution statement is put on those documents so that anyone who uses them can, can find the source, which is of course what I was just sharing a few moments ago. So this attribution page just gives some, some um, more links and information about the license and then a couple of examples of what that attribution um, statement would look like. So very straightforward. Um, and it's just essentially copied and put in the document somewhere, either in the header, the first page, the footer, just so that folks that, that stumble across that, that, that version or use that version know where the source material is. Um, 
accessibility i'll very quickly talk about this accessibility in in google docs is is, is pretty extensive um one of the one of the accessibility features that allows the outline to be used is that we've we've been very intentional about using um, styles throughout the documents. And this allows for this easy um, navigational um, feature to be used within Google. It also helps screen readers as well use Google documents so that they can very clearly describe the, the page content to a user that's using a screen reader. Um, you also note that alternative text has been used throughout um, all our materials in Google Docs. So this is short descriptive sentences um, in any images and diagrams that are used in the curriculum materials. Again, um, to allow um, folks that, that, that are using a screen reader to sort of fully um, experience the, the, the imagery that's used throughout the materials. Um, and finally, modification and export. Um, I talked about a couple of things as I was in um, the module one Google Docs, but this is just an information page that sort of walks you through step by step the process of making a local, making a local copy, what that allows you to do in terms of editing that copy. Um, if you want to share access to your version to to peers or or other folks how to do that. And then of course, um, there's different export options in Google Docs as well. We can export a Google Doc in a couple of different formats. Um, if we are more um, comfortable or familiar using Word, for example, we can export it as a Word document. Or if we are wanting something that's pretty stable to maybe share with, with other folks, we can do, do uh, an export in PDF as well. So this page just kind of provides a little bit more detail on, on the step-by-step -step for those things. So I do encourage you, if you've not done so already, um, to sign up. Um, I'm sure Dan is keeping an eye on the, on the sign-ups page as we speak. Um, and, and explore the materials, have a look, um, review the, the South Africa student materials, instructor notes, get a feel for the flow of the materials. Even if you want to shore up on your um, understanding of completing tax forms, um, I encourage you to go to unit 1.7 in Quantley Core and maybe um, spend some time getting a refresher on that front. Um, Last thing uh, I want to showcase in our OER website is the courseware page, the courseware area. So I can come to my home page. I can click on my, my courseware page. And Quartway and Statway Digital Courseware is, of course, the, the technology platform that can be used to deliver Quantway or Statway experiences. Um, this page sort of talks and speaks to a little bit about some of the benefits of, of using a specifically designed technology platform to support learning. Um, a couple of things I do want to call out that I think is particularly interesting is the different modality affordances that using technology grants. Uh, so um, using technology, of course, Everything that you see in Google Docs um, in the downloads area for courses is built in the digital platform. So even the, the, the collaborative components, in addition to homework activities that are done prior to and post collaboration, everything is, is in the digital space. So this allows for implementations of Quantway and Statway to have that 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 dual component of rich collaborative experiences plus individual activities that, that learners can do online. Um, getting immediate feedback, getting supports, that scaffolding support that's built into the online system where they have hints and access to full solutions as they're going through the materials. Um, and of course, 
much like what we see at the University of the Free State, use of, of courseware allows for fully online implementation. As I mentioned, the collaborations are built in, in the digital space as well. So we've got a lot of flexibility about how we can think about creating online experiences where students and groups engage with those collaborative activities. And last thing I'll mention there that again, um, and this is what the University of Free State um, implement, the digital courseware can be integrated with um, essentially any uh, learning management system. So we, we've, we run the digital course through Blackboard, through Canvas, through Brightspace. We've got many implementations that use different learning management systems. And of course, for those of you that, that, that are aware when we integrate into a learning management system, it makes that experience both for, for instructors, for faculty and students so smooth and streamlined because they can access all the material through their, their learning management system. And all the, all the work that the students do in the digital space, the integration allows all their, all their scores and grades to be, to be pushed back into the learning management system gradebook. So it, it really keeps everything nice and contained within the learning management system. So I encourage you after sort of exploring the materials, if you want to read a little bit more about the the some of the, the key features of the digital tool, please do come to the, the courseware page. There's lots more information and examples um, on this page as you as you scroll further down. Now I recognize that we are quickly coming up to the end of the hour here. And I do want to just spend a few final minutes um, kind of pulling all this together and, and showcasing a couple of different options that, that maybe some of you are thinking about already, um, given what we have shared today, um, in particular what, what Dan and, and I have shared in, in more recent minutes. So we can, this table here shows um, a couple of different implementation options. Um, the first here, uh, which is the, the orange column, this is an implementation option that utilizes the, the documents only. So there's a, a couple of things that, that I think would be important to point out with this type of implementation. So as I mentioned, this would involve using the Google Docs um, and, and exporting these as either Word or, or PDF format and printing and sharing um, those, those versions with, with students in, in this, this type of implementation. This implementation does not use a, a digital platform. So it's probably more applicable to, to an in-person, to a face-to-face -face, um, learning experience where everyone is only ever working with, with either Word or, or PDF or even Google Docs versions of, of the materials. The key benefit here, of course, is that there's no cost to the institution, there's no cost to the student at all. Um, and that if a, an instructor or an instructing team want to make edits, they can do so to the Google Docs and they then kind of re-export those edited versions as Word and PDF and use them in a in a face-to-face -face implementation. So some, some positives with this implementation model, but some clear um, kind of limitations that there, there being no digital component is, is maybe something that a lot of learners um, would be surprised at in, in 2024. I think it's, it's now very much the norm that learners expect and want a digital component when they, when they are engaging in a learning experience. Um, and of course, when we use paper only materials, there, there might be a, a, a heightened administrative lift on the instructor side if they are implementing um, assigning individual um, activities before in class lessons. 
but it is possible under this this new OER model. Option two here um, is in yellow. And of course, as this links to the type of license that we have applied to our materials. The CCBYNC license um, allows instructors to do virtually anything to the materials beyond try to, to make commercial gain from, from anything that they do do. And one of those things could be taking the materials and, and representing some of those those materials in, for example, your your institution's own learning management system. So this would allow for a digital component to be included in the learning experience. It opens up maybe a couple of different modalities to be deployed, um, but it still maintains no cost. Um, so there's you've got Word, PDFs, if, that, if that's what you're going to use, but you've also got elements that elements of, of Quantway or Statway built into the LMS directly. Um, positives here, again, the, the no cost aspect is, is maintained. At the institution level, there's no cost beyond the time and effort. I think for, for some folks here, if you've ever embarked on a, on a digital content authoring project, the, the, the lift is substantial. Um, so there, there is time and effort tied to this type of implementation. Um, and I'll also say as well, depending on the, the, the learning management system that's being used, there of course could be some redesign um, elements and um, different learning management systems have different features, different item types. So some of the content that that is currently in Google Docs might have to be modified to fit best with the way that the learning management system would take new content. So that possibly reduces some of the, the sophistication of the, the materials, depending on what modifications would have to be made. Um, option three would be um, utilizing um, Quantway, Statway digital courseware. Um, Although this type of implementation could use the Google Docs in some way, if you wanted there to be learners to have access to different format, formatted versions of the materials, you could use it, but it wouldn't be necessary. Um, and this would use Quantway and Statway built in the, in the Revisit platform. Again, this affords different mod flexibility and modalities. Um, this option does carry um, a student cost, however. Um, I think in the in the landscape of of materials um, or, or cost of, of access materials, we have endeavored to, to try and keep this as, as as low as possible. And I will state here that the the cost that's associated with this implementation, is not tied to the materials themselves, but instead is tied to um, the the server cost really of of running and delivering um, these digital experiences, in addition to the the technical support that's offered as well. So that is essentially what what is is being paid for as opposed to the materials. Um, obvious um, positives here. I mean we have been using um, the Revise It platform for, for near on six years now. Um, and it was a very specific um, and intentional choice. Um, a lot of, of how that platform renders mathematics content is very much, very much aligns with the key principles of, of Quantway and Statway. So there is a there is a richness to the, to the interaction with materials um, in the Revise It platform. The big, perhaps, drawback here is that the digital content is not editable. So it's a fixed um, experience. Um, and this, of course, um, this third implementation model is, is, is what we see um, our partners at, at the University of the Free State go with. So it's there'll be lots of, of resources 
on their campus um, around some of the key things to think about there. Um, at that, and I know I'm two minutes, I know Dan said we had more than, than a couple of minutes for, for Q&A. I will pause here. Um, Dan, if there's anything you want to, to quickly address, anyone from, from um, Anna, Anna Ree, Corlea, Francois, anything you want to weigh in on, um, please um, take up the, the last few minutes here. No, thanks, Lewis. All good from our side. Very happy to see that, that South African version. Thanks, Lewis. Yes, it looks fantastic, I must say. All right, thank you very much, Lewis. And thank you very much, colleagues. I see there's been some debate in the, in the chat. Um, and various questions that have been asked by our SADI colleagues who are going to distribute it on the Siap Malela network. Thank you very much for that, uh, Tony. Colleagues, I don't know whether there's any questions you have. We'll give five minutes uh, for some questions that you might have um, for us. Francois, sorry, I just, if colleagues have to leave on the hour, just mm. want to draw the attention. I did leave my, my email address in the in the chat box and, yeah. and they are to email me as well with questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Anari. I also see that Loiso has put in um, the evaluation a little bit earlier. Give feedback um, uh, on the um, workshop. Uh, so I'm very grateful for that. Any questions, colleagues? Anything that's unclear? Looks like we've given people a lot to digest, uh, lots of materials. Yeah, um, Lewis, I uh, think uh, a lot of uh, emotions for the team that have worked so hard on the South African material. It's really a privilege to see it on a screen. So thank you for that. Um, oh, yeah, I want to take uh, this opportunity to thank our American colleagues uh, for getting up early. Um, uh, Karen uh, earliest, then Dan, and then Lewis came in. Thank you so much for, for making the time to be with us. Um, to uh, my South African colleagues, you can clearly see that Cordelia and Anari are the stars. Uh, that's part of a galaxy of people working together um, uh, to realize uh, this innovation. And then to our SADI colleagues uh, for allowing us the platform to share the work. Um, thank you so much uh, for the kind comments and for um, uh, uh, the appreciation, Lungile and uh, Oliver and uh, Jan Paul. Um, I'm sure Tony will give you. Uh, we, you can, in terms of the where we can get access to the recording. I don't know whether Sadi colleagues want to give an indication. Yes, Francois, I'll be sharing the recording with all the participants. Okay, great. And colleagues, thank you so much to everybody for their hard work and for the inspiring presentation and to all of you for attending. I'm so glad that we became more and more towards the end and that people uh, stuck with us. I hope you have a wonderful day. Um, lots of coffee for our American colleagues during the day because it's going to be a longer one. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, bye.